so the name of this talk came to me at 11 o'clock at night, about a week ago. And when I get a talk like that, I know it's for me to pay attention. Because I know it's a message for me. So what is holy ground? Well, we chose this song, and I didn't realize in this song there was the piece about the burning bush. Because the scripture I chose today is from Exodus 3, 5. Now, I never start with a scripture, but I'm, I'm starting today. We're just changing things up a little bit, see if you're paying attention. <laughs> so Exodus 3, 5 is about Moses tending his father-in-law's sheep on Mount Sinai in the wilderness. There's nobody else around. You ever been someplace where you've kind of been alone in the wilderness? And all of a sudden, there's this bush burning over here, but the fire's not consuming it. So would you go take a second look? Yeah, probably, right? And then you get close to it, and you realize it's pretty hot, so you back away. And all of a sudden, from the bush, someone's calling your name. No? Roz. <laughs> Billy. Susie. So what does Moses do? He gets a little closer. He's curious. And his voice is telling him it's God. God's talking to him from this bush. And as he gets so close, the voice says, Remove the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you stand is holy ground. So this morning, about 7 a.m., I get a text from Danny, who was going to do this song with Fern. I hurt my foot. I can't walk. Kim, who's our office assistant, was going to be in here to help. I get a text around 7.30. I'm not feeling good. I won't be there. Yesterday, Robert Buck, John, and Kayla, who does the sound, were in here six hours working on our sound system because it wasn't working. And when they left about 7.30 last night, they said there's still something wrong with it. And then about five of, I looked around, and Dixie, who does the meditation, wasn't here. And I went, oh, I guess this is holy ground. <laughs> so when Moses got up to the bush, God told him that he was the one chosen to lead the Israelites out of Egypt. Do you ever get that little intuition, that little nudge that says you're supposed to do something, you're guided to do something? Well, here's God talking to Moses out of the bush, and what does Moses do? I can't tell them that. They're not going to listen to me. Who am I? Did you ever think about that? Who am I to do this? I'm not good enough, big enough, important enough. God encourages Moses, and Moses goes, Nobody's going to believe that God appeared to me. Do you ever have a vision, an intuition, and think nobody's going to believe this? This is just too big. And so God continues to talk to Moses. Do you get that? Does that voice keep talking to you, and you keep ignoring it, and you keep finding excuses? And then Moses says, Moses had like a lisp. He didn't talk very well. And he said, I don't speak well. They're not going to understand me. Have my brother Aaron do it. He speaks well. And God said, I will be with you, and I will give you the words in your mouth. When you get those taps on your shoulder, when you get those thoughts, when you get those little nudges of intuition, take some time. You're standing on holy ground. Take some time, pay attention, and know that everything you need to do you have the power to do. You have the guidance to do. A friend of mine loves India. He's made three trips there. He's just come back. He was there for five weeks this time. And one of the things he had to do was bathe in the river Ganges. Now, the Ganges River is the holiest river in any religion. The Hindus believe that the land under the river is holy ground. And Ganga is the goddess of the river, and they worship Ganga and the river as one in the same. 
And any ritual, anything done near or in the river, is believed that you receive multiple blessings, healings, that your sins are washed away. Dying next to it, being, having the body cremated, having your ashes spread in it, is liberation from the life and death cycle. Well, one of the things my friend really wanted to do was witness a cremation on the, the steps that are called the ghats. There's the wide steps. I think we have a picture. Yeah, these steps that go down. So they hired a local person to take him to a cremation so that him and his, his traveling companion could watch it. And he said that the smoke was intense. It was just smelly smoke burning their eyes everywhere. And after the ritual, he still wanted to go in the water. Now here's the thing, he also know the Ganges River is considered healing because where it comes out of the mountains, it's crystal pure. But, and there's, a, a, there's something in it that heals. However, by the time it gets down into the cities, there's 400 million people that live on its banks. And the levels of fecal matter are 100 times greater than what's regarded safe. It's estimated that one third of all deaths in India are due to the illness from the water. And yet my friend was still going to go in this water. And he went in and he did his little ritual and he put water all over him and his traveling companion went with him. They've been back about four weeks now. It took him a week or so to get over the illness. His friend is still sick, still hasn't returned to health. There's a song, I'm going to probably keep up this one. I'm just probably going to bounce all over the place. I used to live in Santa Barbara, California in the 80s. And that was my um, Western dancing kind of bar days with the cowboy boots and the cowboy hats. So as I'm writing this talk, this song is going through my head. I'm like, why is this going through my head? Well, it was written in the 80s when I was in Santa Barbara. And the song is looking for love in all the wrong places. Anybody remember that? So as I was writing this talk, I'm thinking, maybe we're looking for God in all the wrong places. Maybe I don't have to go to India and swim in polluted water to know God, to experience God. When I lived in Connecticut, I was a yoga teacher. I taught eight to 10 classes of yoga a week. And one of the places I taught was Pfizer Pharmaceutical Company, big plant. And I had to go through the locked gates to get in and teach. And one of my students decided he was going to India, that one of the master teachers was there. He was going to go study with him. And I talked him out of it the first time. And there was a cancellation. He went, that's it, I'm going. So he went. And the ashram was in this field, and they had, you've seen the Indies that wear the mask over their face, he w and he said, well, now I know why, because the bugs go up your nose and in your mouth, you can't, you know, can't breathe, can't talk. And he said, and then I asked where the bathroom was, and they pointed to the field behind the ashram, which was the public toilet. And the people that were living there were coming to him, asking him about yoga and to teach them, and he was just a beginner. He thought he had to go to India to know God more. And he also got sick and had to return early. There's nothing wrong with traveling and do sacred pilgrimages, but we don't have to. We don't have to go anywhere. Remove the sandals from your feet for the place on which you stand is holy ground. What God is telling Moses is to notice the holiness all around. So today you drove here in the rain. Where were your thoughts? What were you thinking? Did you see any holiness? Anyone? What did you see? Rain, trees, uh, wet, fresh, yeah. Uh, and I realized this is God. This is God. Bo. Can you talk loud so everybody can hear you? I didn't draw, but I was out by the pond. I watched the water drops as the rain fell on the pond, the little circles that came out. 
Well, he really lives on holy ground. I mean, he lives here. You know, come on. <laughs> Give us a break. Roz. The landscaping that Bo has done, yes. Yeah. Chris. You heard the trees and plants. Yeah. Good, thank you. Anybody else? It's all around us. When I remember to look, stop rushing, let those thoughts of worry disappear, right? Brother Lawrence, some of you may have heard of Brother Lawrence. He was a monk who lived in a monastery in France in the 1600s, and it was a time of great unrest. And his job was in the kitchen. He cooked, he scrubbed pots. Now, you know, there's a lot of monks in these, in these monasteries, and they don't have dishwashers, and they don't have soap like we did today. Remember, this is the 1600s. It was a messy job. So he cleaned pots, he cleaned, he cleaned the monastery, he was at the constant bidding of his superiors, he even repaired their sandals. But of those of you that know, Brother Lawrence and know about this monk, he's known for his quiet presence. He's known for his simplicity, his humble grace. Because he understood the holiness of everyday life. My life changes when I get this. Every detail of life becomes sacred. No matter how hard, no matter how mundane or routine my life appears, I can find the holiness, I can find the sacred in it. Brother Lawrence had written letters to a friend when he was in the monastery, and they were compiled into a little booklet. And the booklet is called Practicing the Presence of God. What does that mean? Practicing the presence of God. Just what we said, the awareness to move out of my, my stressful thoughts, all those busy thoughts in my head, and take a moment and take that breath. I am love. Take that breath and really look around me. We live in paradise. We are so fortunate to live here. Do wake up in the morning with that gratitude, that awareness. When I practice the presence of God, Wherever I'm standing is holy ground. Where you're sitting right now, your feet are planted on holy ground. It's said we're living in a very hectic, stressful time. But you know what? Wherever you go back in history was a hectic, stressful time, right? You're just living in this one. The fact is that my stress is determined by what? My thinking, right, my thoughts, and how I react to my circumstances. So a friend of mine, well, people have been giving me great examples, I'll tell you, it's easy to find these examples. So a friend of mine needed to get some important paperwork done. After an hour on the phone, on hold, you been there, right? He was told that, oh, you'll have to go to this office, which was on the other side of the city he was in. So he drove there, got there, spent, you know, an hour or so there to say, you know, we don't have it here. You've got to go to our office. It's on the other side of this busy city, which he drove through all the traffic to get there. He got there, spent time there to learn, oh, you know, it's got to come from this office out of state. We'll have it tomorrow, but it'll be in that other office that you were at. So he went home. The next day, got up and started the procedure again. Went to the first office, sent him to the second office. And at this time, frustrated, he's going, God, give me patience and grace. God, give me patience and grace. And at the second office, they said, We'll definitely have it tomorrow (laughs) at the first office. And as he was driving home, he realized that he needed to choose his thoughts. And he made the change from God give me patience and grace to I am choosing patience and grace. Close your eyes, say that with me. I am choosing patience and grace. Whatever's in your life right now, put that right there and go, 
I am choosing patience and grace. One more time. I am choosing patience and grace. Guess what? The next day, it was easy, and he got his papers. Jesus once said to his disciples, do you still not understand? You still don't get it. You just watched me feed 4,000 people with four, four loaves of bread, five loaves of bread, whatever it was, and you still don't get it. Are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes and fail to see? Do you have ears and fail to hear? Holy ground moments are always right where our feet are. They're right in the moment. And I don't have to go to India, and I don't have to live in a monastery in France. They may not be as dramatic as that burning bush. But when I open my heart, when I really let my eyes see, when I really hear, I'm going to discover the holy ground in all my everyday, mundane, routine moments. No matter how hectic and frustrating life is, no matter how it seems to be somebody else's fault, remember these cards, it's not about me. In that moment, When I'm saying, God, give me patience and grace, can I shift it? Can I shift it and make it all about me? Can I choose to be kind to that person telling me I have to drive to the other side of town for the papers I need? Can I choose to find grace in the midst of any stressful situation in my life? I stand on holy ground right where I am when I connect to that power that is so much bigger than me, bigger than my ego, bigger than my personality. I love the song that Fern sang talked about the miracles. Einstein said there are two ways to live your life. One is though nothing is a miracle. The other is as though what? Everything is a miracle. There are many, many wonderful, sacred, holy places in this world. It's great to make pilgrimages to them. We had Mo who was here that walked the way at one time. But we don't have to travel anywhere to experience holy ground. That's what I want you to hear this morning. Like Brother Lawrence, I can make every day a sacred pilgrimage. Elizabeth Barrett Browning wrote these words. Earth's crammed in heaven and every common bush of fire with God. But only he who sees takes off his shoes. The rest sit around it and pluck blackberries. <laughs> so life can be frustrating, it can be challenging, and I can just sit around and pluck those blackberries. Or I can choose to open my heart, my eyes, my ears, and live from patience, grace, kindness, with awareness of God's presence everywhere in all people, even the ones making me drive across town, in all things. In every breath you take, you have the choice of how you're going to experience your life. So this week and from now on, pay attention and notice those burning bushes. Notice God's presence and notice that wherever you are is truly holy ground. God bless you.